Hello and welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Copyright in Works, Section Three, or the rights covered by copyright. Copyright. It seems pretty straightforward. The right to copy, but the term copyright is actually misleading. It refers to a whole bundle of rights, so many different rights that it wouldn't make sense to list all of them every time. And so the singular but reductive copyright serves as a stand-in. The rights under copyright are detailed in Section Three of the Copyright Act. From a rights holder's perspective, Section Three is the heart of the Act. Even if some of the rights seem rather awkwardly phrased, possibly narrow, and maybe even not important at all. For example, one of the rights under copyright is the sole right to present at a public exhibition for a purpose other than sale or hire an artist's work created after June seventh, nineteen eighty-eight, other than a map, chart, or plan. Don't ask what happens if you want to present your art created on June sixth, nineteen eighty-eight, at a public exhibition. In addition to spelling out the full set of rights that make up copyright, Section Three also contains some important elements that influence copyright overall because of the very specific language that is used. At the broadest level, Section Three One notes that copyright in relation to a work means the sole right to produce or reproduce the work or any substantial part thereof in any material form, whatever. It may not seem like it, but there are some significant points here. The first is the phrase "sole right." Sole right is important because it means the copyright holder doesn't just have the right to reproduce the work; it means that only the copyright holder has that right. While there are exceptions to copyright infringement, copyrights are exclusive, or perhaps more accurately, exclusionary rights. Another crucial term is substantial. While determining what may constitute substantial or non-substantial isn't the focus of this module, the inclusion of this word means that in some cases, if what you are reproducing is a very small and non-central piece of a work, copyright concerns do not apply. A third key concept is in any material form. This is an important phrase because it notes that reproduction of copyright-protected material is not tied to a specific media or format, including the format it was originally produced in. In other words, if an essay first appears as a blog post, the copyright holder has the sole right to reproduce it not only as a blog post but also as part of a book or periodical, or even if they want to, on stone tablets. Section three one also includes a list of other sole rights of the copyright holder. The first of these, three one a, is the right to produce, reproduce, perform, or publish any translation of the work. For example. If you love this script and you want to translate all of it into Japanese, your translation would probably be considered infringement if done without our permission. Of course, since we've applied a Creative Commons license to this script, you actually have our permission, subject to the terms of that license. Section three also includes a number of rights involving changing a work betwixt various types of works. It's important to note that changing a work among types of works will generate new copyright-protected works. For example, if you write a novel, you have the sole right to convert that novel into a dramatic work, like a play. If you were to write the play based on your novel, you would have a new copyright on the written play as well as the original copyright on the novel. If someone else wanted to take your play and perform it, or turn it into a movie, they would need your permission as the copyright holder, and any recordings of that play or the movie itself would result in new copyrights. These same rights also work going in the opposite direction. For example, if you write a play and adapt it into a novel, there are also similar provisions regarding adaptations among literary, dramatic, and musical works, as well as sound recordings and films, or more accurately, cinematographic works. Subsection three one f details another important sole right of the copyright owner: the right to communicate a work to the public by telecommunication. So, what exactly does this mean? In simpler terms, this right covers the distribution of works over the internet and other forms of telecommunication. However, this right doesn't cover every means of telecommunicating a work. It doesn't cover single point-to-point -point or person-to-person -person forms of telecommunication like email, phone, and faxes. That said, the telecommunication right does cover mass unsolicited faxing or emails like spamming. More importantly, it also includes posting material on publicly available internet sites. Furthermore, a communication is still considered to the public, regardless of whether the material can be downloaded or is streamed. 
Court and copyright board decisions have clarified that in cases where the telecommunication right is infringed on the Internet, it is not the Internet service provider that is responsible, but the uploader. Subsection 31J includes another awkwardly worded but important sole right. The subsection notes that in the case of a work that is in the form of a tangible object, to sell or otherwise transfer ownership of the tangible object, as long as that ownership has never previously been transferred in or outside Canada with the authorization of the copyright owner. In regard to the tangible object piece, this is a way of talking about a book, a vinyl record, a CD, or a DVD, but not just the digital file. Essentially, it's referring to the container of an intellectual good. So, as a rights holder, if you have your intellectual work embodied in a physical object, like a book or a CD, you can control the right to sell that object. However, this right is not absolute. Your ability to limit the sale of the tangible object applies only to the first sale. Looking at it from the user's perspective, if you buy a book or a CD, you have control over the physical object, but the rights holder still controls the copyright in the intellectual work contained by the object. In other words, if you buy a book or a CD, you can do whatever you want with the physical object. You can enjoy it, you can use it as a coaster, you can even burn it in your fireplace if you want to, but you don't have the same rights to the underlying intellectual work as the rights holder does. You can't make copies, translate the work, or telecommunicate it to the public unless you're relying on an exception to infringement like fair dealing. Section 31J gets at what is called the exhaustion doctrine in Canadian copyright, but you might know it by the similar U.S. concept, the first sale doctrine. Finally, immediately after subsection J, which covers the last of the ten rights in copyright, there is one more key element to the section. This notes that in addition to these ten rights, the rights holder has the sole right to authorize such acts. As noted earlier, the rights in copyright are exclusionary rights, but as the rights holder, you have the ability to separately authorize to groups or other individuals various rights or uses of your work. For example, if you write a novel, you might authorize one person to produce and distribute copies of it, another to create a translation of it, and authorize a third, different set of individuals to disseminate the work over the Internet. Thus, Section 3 of the Copyright Act structures copyright as a bundle of exclusionary rights for the rights holder in a work, who not only has the sole right to make certain uses of the work, but who can also authorize others in relation to those uses of the work. You should now be able to understand copyright as a bundle of rights rather than just the right to copy. Recognize key words for Section 3 that shape copyright, for example, sole right, substantial, and in any material form. And understand that copyright holders may authorize uses by others. This has been the University of Alberta's opening up copyright module on Section 3 of the Copyright Act. Thank you for your attention.